Okay, so today I'm going to briefly introduce you uh, TNO, how to use it, and go over the basic principles behind the libraries. And if you paid attention uh, during yesterday's presentation of TensorFlow, some concepts will be familiar to you as well. And uh, if you paid attention to uh, Hugo La Rochelle's uh, introductionary talk, uh, you'll see some, um, some similar concepts as well. So, uh, there's going to be four main parts. So the first one is, well, these slides and an introduction about uh, what the concept of Tiano are. There is a companion uh, IPython notebook that's on GitHub. So if you go um, on that page or clone that uh, GitHub repository, there is an IPython notebook that basically has all the um, uh, code snippets from these slides so that you can run them uh, at the same time. Uh, then we're going to have a more hands-on example, uh, basically applying uh, logistic regression on the uh, MNIST digits uh, data set. And then if we have time, uh, we'll go quickly over two more examples, uh, ConvNet, so the basic uh, LeNet architecture, and an LSTM uh, for character level um, generation of text. So, TNO is, we can say, a mathematical symbolic expression compiler. So what does that mean? It means that uh, it makes it possible to define expressions that represent mathematical expression um, using NumPy syntax, so it's easy to use, and it supports all the kind of basic uh, mathematical operations like uh, min, max, addition, subtraction, all the kind of basic uh, things, not only larger um, blocks like um, layers of neural nets or whole networks or things like that. Uh, it makes it possible to manipulate those expressions, doing graph substitutions, um, cloning and replacement, things like that, and also making possible to go through that graph and <laughs> Uh, perform things like uh, automatic differentiation, uh, symbolic differentiation, actually, uh, or the R operator for forward differentiation, uh, applying some optimizations for increased uh, numerical stability. And then uh, it's possible to use that optimized graph and TNO's um, runtime to actually compute some values, some output values given inputs. Um, we also have a couple of tools that uh, help debug uh, both TNO's code and the user's code and try to inspect and understand better uh, what's actually happening uh, when you're using TNO. So TNO is currently more than eight years old. Um, it started small with only a couple of contributors from uh, the ancestor of uh, Mila and uh, which was called Lisa at, uh, at the time, and it grew a lot. We now have contributors from all over the world, users from all over the world, and uh, it's been used to drive lots of research papers, uh, prototypes for industrial application in startups and in larger companies. Um, TNO has also been uh, the base of other software projects that built uh, on top of Tiano. So for instance, Blocks, Keras, Lasagne are machine learning, deep learning libraries that use Tiano as a backend and provide some uh, user interface that uh, is a higher level. So that has uh, concepts of uh, layers, of training algorithms, of that kind of things, whereas Tiano is more the backend. Uh, Escalon on Tiano as well, uh, which is nice because it uh, has a converter to load uh, cafe models from the cafe zoo and uh, use them in Tiano, and does a lot of other things as well. Uh, PyMC3 actually uses Tiano not to do machine learning, but probabilistic programming. Uh, and uh, we have two other uh, libraries, Platoon that Mila is developing, and Tiano MPI developed at Guelph. Uh, which are layers on top of Tiano to help train on multiple machines, multiple GPUs, and have some uh, level of uh, model parallelism and data parallelism. 
So, um, how to use TNO? Well, first of all, um, we are working um, with symbolic expression, symbolic variables, so that will uh, make up a computation graph. Uh, so let's see how, how to do that. So um, to define the symbolic expression, so we define the expression first, then uh, we want to compile a function and then execute that function on values. So to define the expression, we start by defining inputs. So the inputs are symbolic variables that have some type. So you have to define in advance whether like this variable is like a vector <coughs> or a matrix, what its uh, data type is, floating point, integers, <coughs> and so on. Uh, so things like the number of dimensions have to be known in advance. Uh, but the shape is not fixed. Uh, the memory layout is not fixed. So you could uh, have shapes that uh, change between like one mini batch and the next or uh, different calls to, do, to the function in general. So uh, X and Y are purely symbolic variables here. We uh, will give them values later, but for now, uh, that's, just, that's just empty. Um, there's another kind of input variables that is shared variables, and they, they're symbolic, but they also hold a value, and that value is persistent across function calls. It's shared between different TNO functions. Um, it's usually used, for instance, for uh, storing parameters of the model that you want to learn. And yeah, these values can be updated uh, as well. So here we create two other variables from, uh, so shared variables from, from values. Uh, this one has two dimensions because its initial values uh, have two dimensions. And uh, this one has only one. So that's basically a weight matrix and a bias. Uh, we can name variables just by assigning to the name attribute. Um, shared variables uh, do not have a fixed side either. They are usually kept fixed in most models, but it's not a requirement. Then from these inputs, we can um, define expressions uh, that will build new variables, intermediate variables, which are the result of some computation. And so for instance, here we can define, well, dot product of X and W, uh, add a bias, apply a sigmoid function on that, and let's say this is our output variable. And from the output variable and Y, we can define just say the uh, squared error uh, cost. So, those new variables are connected to the previous ones through the operations that we define. And we can visualize the graph structure uh, like that by using, for instance, uh, pi.print, which is a helper function. So uh, variables are those squared boxes. And we have other nodes here we call apply nodes that represent the mathematical operation that connects them. So input variables um, and shared variables do not have uh, any ancestors. They don't uh, have any error connecting uh, from them. Uh, but then you see um, that intermediate result and, and more of them. Um, usually when we visualize, uh, we don't necessarily care about all the intermediate variables unless they have a name or something. And so uh, this is a simplified version of exactly the same, the same graph where we hide uh, the unnamed intermediate variables, but you can still see all the operations. And actually, uh, you, you see the, the type uh, on the edges. So once you have defined some graphs, say your forward computation for your model, um, we want to be able to uh, use backpropagation to, to get gradients. So this is just the basic uh, concept of the chain rule. We have a scalar cost. We have. Um, intermediate variables that uh, here are vectors. Uh, here's just the, the chain rule starting from the, from the cost. And um, so the whole derivative of, say, uh, that, uh, that function g is actually a whole Jacobian matrix that's m by n if uh, the intermediate variables are, are vectors of size uh, n and m. And usually you don't need that. And it's 
actually usually a bad idea to compute it explicitly unless you need it for some other purposes. What the only thing you need is an expression that given any vector representing the gradient of the cost with respect to the output will compute you uh, the gradient of the cost with respect to the input. So basically the dot product between that vector and the whole Jacobian matrix. So that's also called the L operator uh, sometimes. And uh, so almost all operations uh, in Tiano implement a function that returns that. And it actually returns not numbers, not a numerical expression for that, but it returns a symbolic expression that represents that computation. Again, usually without having to explicitly represent or define that uh, whole Jacobian matrix. So you can uh, call tiano.grad, which will backpropagate through the graph uh, from the cost towards uh, the inputs that, that you give. And along the way, it will call that grad method of each operation backpropagating, I mean, starting from one for the cost and backpropagating uh, through the whole graph, accumulating when you have the same variables that used uh, more than once and so on. And again, uh, here, so DCDW and DCDB, they are symbolic expression. Uh, the same way as if you had manually um, defined the gradient expression using TNO operations like the dot product, the sigmoid, and so on that, we, that we've seen earlier. Uh, so we have no numerical values at that point, and uh, they are part of the computation graph. So the computation graph was extended to add these, uh, these variables. And we can continue uh, extending the graph from these variables, for instance, to compute update expressions corresponding to gradient descent, something like that, like, like we do here. Uh, so, for instance, this is what the extended graph uh, for the gradients looks like. So you see there's like a lot of small operations that have been inserted. And the outputs you have actually here, the gradient with respect to the bias, which is both an output and an intermediate result that will help compute the gradient with respect to the weights. And here's the uh, graph for the update expressions. Uh, so you have as intermediate, uh, as, uh, intermediate variables the gradients that we had on the previous slide, and then basically just the scaled version uh, with the constant 0 0.1 that's somewhere. So once we have defined the whole graph, the whole expression that we actually uh, care about from the inputs and initial weights to the um, weight updates for our training algorithm. Uh, we want to compile a function that will be able to actually compute those numbers uh, given inputs and perform the weight updates. So to compute values, uh, what we do is called tiano.function. And you provide it with the input variables that you want to feed and the output variables that you want to get. And you don't have necessarily to provide values for all the inputs that you might uh, have declared, especially if you don't want to go all the way uh, through the end of the graph. You can have a function that only computes a subset, expression for a subset of the graph. For instance, we can have a predict function here that goes only from x to out. We don't need values from y. We don't need uh, and so uh, the gradient and so on will not be computed. It's just going to take a small part of the graph and, uh, and make a function out of it. So, uh, so that's it. And you can first compile it, get value, and call it. So you have to provide uh, values for all the input variables that, uh, that you define. Uh, you don't have to provide values for shared variables, the W and B that we declared earlier. Uh, they are implicit inputs to all the functions, and their value will automatically be, be fetched uh, when it's needed. You can declare other functions, like a monitoring function that computes both the output and the cost. So you have two outputs. You also need the second input, y. Um, you can compute the 
a function that does not start from the beginning. Like for instance, if I want an error function that only computes the, uh, the mismatch between the prediction and the actual target, then I don't have to start from the input. I can just start from the prediction and compute the cost. Then the next thing that we want to do is uh, update shared variables for training it's, uh, it's necessary. And again, you can pass to TNO functions uh, updates, a list of updates. And updates are pairs uh, of a shared variable and a symbolic expression that will compute the new uh, value for that shared variable. So you can see update W and update B here as implicit outputs of the function, like W and B were implicit inputs. Update W and update B are implicit outputs that will, compute it, uh, that will be computed at the same time as C. And then after all the outputs are computed, the updates are actually um, effective and uh, the values are updated. So um, here if we print the value of B uh, before and after having, calling, uh, after having called the train function, then we see the value has changed. Um, what happens also during a graph compilation is that the, the subgraph that we selected for that particular function gets optimized. And what we mean by that is that it's going to be rewritten in parts. There are some uh, expressions that will be substituted and so on. And um, there are different, uh, different goals for that. Um, some are quite simple, that for instance, if we have um, the same uh, computation being defined twice, we only want it to be executed once. If you have uh, expressions that are not necessary, you don't want to compute them at all. For instance, if you have x divided by x, you don't want, uh, we, and, and x is not used anywhere else, we just want to, to replace that by one. There are numerical stability optimizations. For instance, well, log of one plus x uh, can uh, underflow if uh, x is really small and this would give zero, whereas it should be close to x. Uh, things like log of softmax get optimized into one more stable log softmax operation. Uh, it's also the time where in place and destructive operations are inserted. Uh, for instance, if an operation is the last to be executed on some numbers, it can, instead of allocating output memory, uh, it can just work in place on its input and so on. Uh, also, um, the transfer of the graph expression to the GPU is, do, is done during the optimization phase. So by default, um, TNO tries to apply most of the optimization so that you have a runtime that's almost as fast as possible, except for a couple of checks and assertions. Um, but if you're iterating and want um, fast feedback and don't care that much about optimization, uh, about uh, the um, uh, runtime speed, then uh, you have a couple of uh, ways of enabling and disabling some sets of uh, optimizations. And um, you can do that either globally or function by function. So, to have a look at, for instance, what happens during um, the, the graph optimization phase, here's uh, the, the original unoptimized graph coming, going from the inputs x and w going to uh, the, the output prediction. It's the same one that we've seen before. And if we compare that with the function, the compiled function that goes from uh, these input variables to out, which was called uh, predict. This is what we have. Uh, I won't go into details about what's happening in there, but here you have a GMV operation, uh, which basically calls um, an optimized uh, BLAS routine uh, that can also um, do multiplication and accumulation uh, at the same time. Uh, we have a sigmoid operation here, can will work in place destructively on its input, which is denoted by the red arrow here. Um, if you have a look at, for instance, the operation, the, the unoptimized graph computing the expression for uh, the updated uh, W and B, this was the original one, and uh, the optimized one is much smaller. 
It has also uh, in-place operations. It has fused LMYs operations. Um, like for instance, if you have a whole tensor and then you do an element-wise, say, um, addition with, with a constant and then a sigmoid and then something else and so on, you want to only loop once through the array and apply all the scalar operations on each element and then go to the next and so on and not iterate each time that you want to apply a new, new operation. And those kind of things happen often uh, when you have automatically generated gradient expressions. Uh, oh, and here you see the update uh, for the shared variables which are inputs. So you see uh, the cost and uh, the implicit outputs for the updated uh, W and B here and here. Another graph visualization tool that exists is uh, debug print, which basically prints a text-based tree-like structure of, uh, of the graph, assigning arbitrary IDs and uh, printing the, the variable names and so on. Um, so here you can see more in detail like what the structure is and you see the input of GMV and the scaling parameters and so on. Um, so when the function is compiled, then we can actually run it. Uh, so a TNO function is a um, callable Python object that, uh, that, we, can, uh, that we can call uh, and we've seen uh, those examples uh, here, for instance, where we call train and so on. But what happens uh, to, to have, um, say, an optimized uh, runtime, uh, it's not only the, the, the graph optimizations, but uh, we also generate uh, C++ or CUDA code uh, for instance, for the LMYs loop fusion that I mentioned, uh, we can't know in advance which element-wise operation will be uh, uh, will occur in which order in any um, graph that the user might define. So uh, we have uh, on-the-fly code generations for that. We generate um, Python module written uh, in C++ or in CUDA that gets compiled and imported back so that we can use it from Python. Uh, the runtime um, environment then uh, calls in the right order uh, the different operations that have to be executed from the inputs to the outputs so that we, um, so that we get uh, the desired results. Uh, we have a couple of different ones and in particular there's one uh, which was written in C++ which avoids having to switch context between the Python interpreter and the C++ execution engine. Um, something else that's really crucial for speed and performance is GPU. Uh, so how to use the GPU in TNO? We wanted to make it as simple as possible in uh, usual cases. So um, now it supports uh, a couple of different data types, uh, not only float32, but double precision if you really need that, integers as well. And uh, we have now easier interaction with GPU arrays from Python itself. So you can um, just use Python code to handle GPU arrays outside of a TNO function if you'd like. Um, all of that will be in the future 0 0.9 release that we hope to get out soon. Uh, and to use it, well, you select um, the device that you want to use, the primary device that you want to use uh, with just a configuration flag. Uh, for instance, use CUDA uh, to get um, the first GPU that's available or one specific one. Um, and if you specify that in the configuration, then all shared variable will by default be created in GPU memory. And the optimizations that move the computation from CPU to GPU, so that replace the CPU operation by GPU operations, uh, are going to be applied. Uh, usually you want to make sure you use float32 or even float16 for storage, which is experimental, but uh, because most GPUs don't uh, have a good performance for, for, uh, um, for the bulk precision. So how you set those configuration flags, uh, you have in order uh, the TNORC configuration file. 
uh, that you can, it's just basic configuration file from, for, for Python. You have an environment variable where you can define those, and the environment variable overrides the config file, and you can also set things directly from Python. Uh, but some flags have to be known in advance before uh, Tiano is, uh, is imported. So for instance, the device itself, uh, you have to set it either in the configuration file or uh, through flags. So I'm going to quickly go over more advanced topics, and if you want to learn more about that, there's other tutorials available online, and there's a documentation on deeplearning.net. Um, so to have loops in the graph, uh, we've seen that the expression graph is basically a directed acyclic graph, and we cannot have um, loops in there. Uh, one way, is if you know, if you know in advance the number of iterations, it's just to unroll the loop, use a for loop in Python that builds all the nodes for all the time steps. Uh, but it doesn't work if you want, for instance, to have um, dynamic, um, uh, dynamic size for the loop. Uh, for models that generate sequences, for instance, it can be an issue. Um, so what we have for that in, in Tiano is called scan, and basically it's one node that encapsulates another whole Tiano function. And that Tiano function or step function is going to compute the, uh, is going to represent the computation that has to be done at each time step. So you have a Tiano function that performs the computation for one time step, and you have the scan node that calls it in a loop, uh, taking care of uh, the bookkeeping of indices and sequences and feeding the right uh, slice at the right point and feeding back the output uh, when needed. And um, having that structure makes it also possible to define a gradient for that node, which is basically another scan node, another loop that goes backwards and uh, applies uh, backprop through time. And uh, it can be transferred to GPU as well, in which case the internal function is going to be transfer to G, um, and recompile on GPU. And uh, there's an example of scan in the uh, LSTM uh, example later. Uh, this is just a small, uh, small example, but it's, uh, we don't really have time for that. Uh, we also have uh, visualization, debugging, and diagnostic tools. One of the reasons uh, it's important is that in Tiano, uh, like in TensorFlow, the definition of a function is separate from its execution. And if something um, doesn't work during the execution, if you encounter errors and so on, then it's not uh, obvious how to connect that from where the expression was actually defined. Um, so we try to have informative uh, error messages, and we have some compilation modes um, that enable to, for instance, check for not a number or for large values. Um, you can assign test values to the symbolic variables so that uh, each time you create a new uh, symbolic uh, intermediate variable, each time you c uh, define a new uh, expression, then it, the test value gets computed. And so you can evaluate on one piece of data at the same time as you build the graph, uh, which can be useful to detect um, shape mismatch errors or things like that. Um, it's possible to extend Tiano in a couple of ways. You can create an op just from Python by uh, calling um, Python wrappers for existing efficient libraries. Uh, you can extend Tiano uh, by writing C or CUDA code. And you can also add optimizations, either for uh, increased numerical stability, for instance, or for more uh, efficient computation, or for introducing uh, your new ops instead of the naive um, versions that, uh, that a user might uh, have used. We have a couple of uh, new features that have been recently added to, to Theano. As I mentioned, the new GPU backend uh, with support for many uh, data types. And uh, we've had some performance improvements especially uh, for convolution to the N3D. 
uh, and especially on GPU. Um, we've made some progress on the time uh, of the op graph optimization phase uh, and also have introduced new ways of avoiding recompiling the same graph over and over again. And we have new diagnostic tools that uh, are quite useful, an interactive visualization, an interactive graph visualization tool, and uh, PDB breakpoints that enables you to monitor a couple of variables and only break if some uh, condition is met, rather than uh, monitoring something every time the, for, for every, every piece of data. In the future, well, we're still working on new operations on GPU. We still want to wrap more CUDNN operations for, um, for better performance. In particular, the basic RNNs sh should be completed in the following days, uh, hopefully. Someone has been working on that uh, a lot recently. Uh, we want better support for 3D convolutions, uh, still faster optimization, and more work on data parallelism um, as well. So, uh, yeah, uh, I want to thank well most of my uh, colleagues and the main TNO developers and uh, people who um, contributed one way or another to our lab and the software um, development efforts, and of course the organizing the, the organizers for for this school. Now. Um, yeah, so the slides are available online. Uh, as I mentioned, there's a companion notebook, and now we can uh, start to, oh, and, uh, and more resources if you want to go, to go further. And now I think that it's time to start the uh, practical examples. So uh, for those who have not uh, cloned the repository yet, then this is uh, the command line you want to, to launch. For those who had cloned it, uh, you might want to do a git pull uh, just to get the latest, uh, to make sure we have the latest versions. And um, you can launch Jupyter Notebook uh, on, the, uh, on the repository itself. So we have three examples uh, that we are going to go over. Um, logistic regression, ConsNet, and LSTM. So, I've launched the Jupyter Notebook here, and uh, let's start with, so Intro Tiano was the companion notebook, so there's nothing new in there, just the code snippets I've showed you already. And, uh, okay, so let's go with the logistic regression. Is that big enough, or do I need to uh, increase the font size? Okay. Um, so I'm going to skip over the text because you probably know already about the model. Um, we have some, uh, we have packaged the MNIST database uh, with the, um, uh, on, the, on GitHub with the repository. So let's load the data. And here, let's see how we define uh, the model. So it's basically the same way that we did in, uh, in the slides. We define uh, sizes that will be useful for the shared variables. We define an input uh, variable. Here it's a matrix because we want to use mini batches. Um, and uh, we have shared variables uh, initialized from uh, zeros. Um, then we define the, our model. So here's our predictor. So the probability of the class given the input, and we're going to use, well, so here the affine uh, model, and then the softmax uh, on top of it, and um, the prediction. If you want to, a hard prediction, it's going to be the class of maximum probability. So argmax over uh, that axis because we still want one prediction for each element of, uh, of the mini batch. Then we define a loss function. So here it's going to be the log likelihood 
of the label given the input or the cross entropy. And we define it simply, uh, we don't have like, we don't need to have one uh, cross entropy or log likelihood um, operation by itself. You can just build it from the basic building blocks. So you take the log of the probability, you take the index of the actual target, and then uh, you take the mean of that to have the mean prediction over uh, the mini batch. <laughs> then derive the gradients, derive the uh, update rules. So again, we don't have like one gradient descent object or something like that. We just build whatever um, rule we we want. Um, so. We yeah, we could use momentum by uh, defining other shared variables that will hold the velocity and then the update expressions for both the velocity and uh, the shared variable itself. And then uh, we compile a train function going for x and y, outputting the loss and updating w and b. So, while the code is getting generated and compiled and the graph is getting optimized. Uh, let's see the next uh, step. Well, we also want to monitor not only the log likelihood, but act the, actually the, um, the misclassification rate on uh, validation and test set. So it's simply the different, like how many um, elements are different between the prediction, which was the argmax and the actual target and the rate is the mean or the mini batch, and we create another, um, we compile another TNO function uh, outputting that and not doing any update, of course. So to train the model, well, first we need to um, process the data a little bit. So we want to feed the model one mini batch of data at a time. So here we have simply a generator, uh, I mean, not really a Python generator, but just a helper function that gives us uh, the mini batch number i, uh, and it's going to be the same function used both for the training and validation and test set. Uh, we define a couple of um, parameters for early stopping in that training loop. It, it's not necessary, it's just like um, a way of knowing when to stop and use only like the best model that was uh, encountered during the optimization. So let's, yeah, let's define that. And this is the main training loop. It's a bit more complex than it might be, uh, but it's because we use this uh, early stopping and we want to only validate when we uh, are confident that the training error has gone down enough. But basically, the, the, the most important part is you loop over the epochs unless uh, unless you encounter the early stopping um, conditions. And then during each epoch, you want to loop over the mini batches and call train model. Then every once in a while, you want to validate and print some uh, result of the validation error. Uh, so uh, here we call test model on the validation set for that and then uh, keep track of what the best uh, model currently is and get the, the test error as well and save the best one. So to save the best one, to save the model, um, we usually just save the values of all parameters, uh, which is more robust than trying to pick all the whole Python object uh, and it also enables more easily transfer to other frameworks, to visualization frameworks and so on. Uh, so let's try to execute that. So of course it's a simple model. The data is not that big, so it should, uh, it should not take that long. So you see that at the beginning, well, almost at each iteration, we are better on the training set. And then after a while, uh, the progress is slower. And, uh, okay. 
So I'll just wait a little bit more. Seems to stall more and more and Okay, and here it's the end after 96 epochs. Uh, so now, uh, if we want to visualize what uh, filters were learned or what uh, the final uh, train model looks like, uh, we just using a helper function called uh, here to visualize the filters. It's not really important, um, but here what we use is we call get value on the weights. Uh, to access the internal value of the shared variable. And then we use that to, uh, to plot uh, the different filters. And we can see it's kind of reasonable, like this is the, the filter for class zero, and you see kind of a, like a zero, a one. Partly what's important for the two is to have like an opening here and so on. So, uh, yeah, if, if we have a look at the final uh, error, well, we can see that the training error is, uh, oh, well, do we see the training error? No, I'm not plotting it. Uh, but the validation and the test error are, are quite high. And we know that the human level performance is quite low and the performance of other models is quite low. So it really means that the model is too simple and we should use uh, something more advanced. So to use something more advanced, uh, if you go back to uh, the home of the Jupyter Notebook, you can have a look at the ConfNet and run uh, Lenet. So this new example is basically, uh, it's the same data. It's still MNIST because it has the advantage of training fast even on an older laptop. And, um, but this time we're going to use a convolutional net uh, with a couple of uh, convolution layers and then fully connected layers um, and then the, the final classifier. So I'm going to make sure that float x is uh, float 32 here. And let's see how we could use Tiano to define um, helper classes that are layers that can uh, make it easier for a user to compose them uh, if they want to, use, to replicate some results or use some uh, classical architectures. Um, this is done uh, usually in frameworks built on top of Tiano, like Keras, like Blocks, like Lasagne. Some people also develop their own mini framework uh, with their own versions of layers and so on um, that they find useful and intuitive. Um, so this logistic regression layer basically holds, um, well, parameters, weight and bias, uh, and uh, computes the, um, well, the conditional probability of classes, prediction holds the params, and uh, have expressions for the negative log likelihood and the errors. Uh, so if you were to use only that class, then uh, it's doing essentially the same as what we did by hand uh, in the, the, the previous uh, notebook. And in the same way, we can define um, a layer that has convolution and pooling. So again, in the init method, we pass it, well, filter shape, image shape, the size of pooling, and so on. Uh, we initialize the weights uh, using the formula from uh, Groro and Benjo uh, 2010, um, and uh, bias from zeros. And then from the input, well, we compute uh, to the convolution with the filters. We then compute max pooling and output, well, tan h of uh, the pooling plus the bias. And here the bias is only like one number for each channel. So which means that uh, you don't have a different bias for each location in the image. So uh, you could actually apply such a layer 
on images of various size uh, without having to, to uh, initialize new parameters or retrain that. <coughs> and then uh, the same way we define the hidden layer, which is just a fully connected layer. Uh, again, initializing weights and bias and expression going from, so the symbolic expression going from the input and the shared variables to uh, the output after activation. Um, and again, we want to collect the parameters so that we know uh, what we will want to train. And then uh, here's a function that has the, the, main, uh, the main loop, the main training loop. So we have a mini batch generator again, it's the same code as, as before. And here we are building the whole graph. So always the same, the same uh, process. We define input symbol, uh, uh, symbolic input variables, matrix and the vector of ints. Here, so L vector is a vector of long because the targets here are um, indices and not, uh, not one hot vectors or masks or something like that. And we create the first layer, which is a Lenet count pool layer with some size. We want to have uh, the next one with also, uh, so yeah, here the, the, the image size changes. Um, this is mostly for efficiency, actually. You don't really have to, uh, to pass that for, for those particular models, uh, but you still need like the shape of, um, of filters. I mean, you have those, those filters anyway. Uh, and then it's useful to, to have those size still because uh, even if the convolution layers can handle arbitrary sized images, then after that we want to flatten uh, the whole the whole uh, feature maps and fit that into a fully connected layer and then to the prediction layer. So this one has to be fixed. So we have to know uh, what the uh, last um, count layer uh, will will have uh, for dimensions. Uh, and here we here we go. Uh, fully connected layer and the output layer. That's just logistic regression class, uh, same as before. Uh, we want the final cost to be the log likelihood of that. We have, uh, again, the errors, which is the misclassification rate. Parameters are the concatenation of the parameters of all layers. And once we have that, we can build uh, the gradient. So just one call of grad of cost with respect to params, get the updates. So again, just regular um, SGD, but we could have um, a class or something that performs like momentum, at grad, at delta, uh, whatever you need. Compile the function. And here we have, again, the early stopping uh, routine with the same main loop uh, for all epochs until we are done, then loop over the mini batches and validate every once in a while and stop when it's finished. So let's just declare that. Loading the data, exactly the same as before. And um, here uh, we can actually run, uh, run that. So this was the result of a, of a previous run. Uh, it, that took five minutes, so uh, I will Probably not uh, have time to do that, but um, here you can see basically what happened. And if you want to run it uh, or try that uh, during the lunch break or, or later, uh, you're welcome to, to play with it. And um, after that, yeah, you can um, visualize the, the, the learned uh, filters as well. Here you, you have them uh, for the first layer. And uh, for the f and here you have the an example of the activations of the first layer for one example. So we have just a little bit more time uh, to cover the LSTM uh, tutorial. I mean example. So if you go back to the home of the Jupyter Notebook, 
and go to LSTM. Then, uh, so this model is an LSTM network that tries to predict the next character of, uh, of a sentence given the previous ones. So, not going to go into details, but here you can see uh, that the LSTM layer is defined here with like shared variables for all the um, uh, the matrices that uh, that you need and the different biases for the different gates and so on. So you have a lot of parameters. Uh, it would be possible and sometimes more efficient to actually define, say, only one variable uh, that contains uh, the concatenation of a couple of matrices. And uh, that way you could do more efficient, uh, bigger matrix, matrix multiply. Uh, but this is just one, uh, one simple implementation. And here's an example uh, of how to use a scan for the loop. So here we define a step function um, that takes, well, uh, a couple of different, uh, different inputs. So you have like the different uh, activation and so on from the previous time steps. You have the current uh, sequence input and so on. And from them, uh, here's basically the, the LSTM formula where you have the dot product and sigmoid or tan h of the different uh, connection inside the cell. And in the end, uh, you have the, the hidden and uh, that, uh, that gate. So once you have that, that step function um, is going to be passed to tno.scan where uh, the sequences are the mask and the input. So the mask um, is, uh, is useful because we're using many batches of sequences and not all the sequences in the same batch have the same length. Also for efficiency, we usually want to group them with, uh, to, to group examples of similar length uh, together, but it, they may not always be exactly the same length. So, uh, in that case, we pad that to only the longest sequence in the mini batch, not the longest sequence in the whole set, just for the mini batch. But we still have to pad and uh, remember like what's the length of the different sequences uh, is in order for us to correctly predict and backpropagate. Um, so let's define that. Uh, here we define the cost function, that's the categorical cross-entropy of the sequence. And here again, you see that the mask is used so that we don't uh, consider the predictions after the end of the sequence. Logistic regression, the same as before, just the final cost. Here for processing the data, uh, we're using Fuel, which is another tool uh, being developed by a couple of students at Mila, and uh, it's nice because um, it can read from uh, just plain text data, do some pre-processing on the fly, including things that I mentioned earlier, like um, grouping um, sequences by similar length and then shuffling them and padding and doing all of that. Uh, and so it outputs like a generator that you can f then feed in your main loop uh, through a TNO function. <laughs> so that whole preprocessing happens outside of TNO and then um, the preprocessed values are fed into, um, into the TNO function. So yeah, here we build our final TNO graph. We have symbolic inputs for, uh, well, the input and the mask. We create uh, LSTM layer, the logic rec layer, define our cost, parameters are the concatenation of the parameters of logistic regression and the recurrent uh, layer. Take the gradients of cost with respect to all parameters. Um, so as I mentioned, uh, it's going to use backprop through time to get the gradient through the scan operation. 
the update rule, um, again, simple uh, SGD, no momentum, nothing. It's something that you could add if you want to play with it and uh, compile to function to, to evaluate the model. So here the main loop is uh, training and we also have another function that generates uh, one character at a time given the previous ones. So that's why we, we declare like inputs here. And so there's that uh, speak function that uh, get uh, probability predictions, we normalize them because we're working in float 32 and sometimes if you divide by the sum and resum, then it doesn't add up to one. So we want a higher precision for just that operation and then try to generate, uh, to generate uh, a, a sequence every once in a while. So again, this is the result of a previous run. So we seed the, um, so for, for monitoring, we seed um, that prediction with the meaning of life is, and then we let the network generate. Uh, so if I try to run it now, it's going to be long, but um, here's some examples that I generated uh, yesterday in a previous run. So it starts with not that much, and it has like a couple of, Unusual characters, I mean, it, it's usually, um, I mean, it's not usual to have like one Chinese character in the middle of, uh, of, uh, of words. You have like punctuation in the middle of words and so on. Uh, but then as it, uh, as it progresses, uh, you see that um, it, it's getting slowly better and better. And, uh, the meaning of life is is the that and so on. It, 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 so, of course, this is not what's going to give you the the actual meaning of life. But yeah, a tons lot of ham. Why not? <laughs> and uh, and uh, this is this. Sure. <laughs> so um, yeah. So so I interrupted the the um, the training at some point. Uh, but you, you can play with it a little bit, and uh, here are some uh, suggestions of things you might want to do, like better um, training algorithms, different um, nonlinearities inside the LSTM cell, uh, different initialization of weights, uh, try to generate something else that the meaning of life is, and uh, yeah. So uh, I hope I could give you a good introduction of what Tiano is, what it can be used for, and what you can build uh, on top of it. And um, if you have if you have any questions uh, later, then uh, we have um, Tiano users mailing lists. We are answering questions on uh, Stack Overflow as well, and um, we would be happy to have your feedback. Time for a few qu quick questions. There's one here. Could you go to the mic? Can you just give a quick example of what debugging might look like in Theano? Could you just break something in there and show us what happens and how you'd figure out what it was? Um, sure. Um, actually, yeah, I think I had one. Um, okay, so let's let's go to say a simple. Simpler example, um, okay, so I'm just going to go to the logistic regression one and say, for instance, that um, when I initialize my uh, thing, I don't have the right, uh, I don't have the right shape. So you can still build the, the whole symbolic graph and at the time where you want to uh, actually execute it, then uh, you have an error message 
that tells you shape mismatch, x has a lot of columns and some rows, but y has only that number of rows. And uh, the apply node that caused the error is that dot product and gives the input again. And in that case, it tells you, uh, it's not really able to tell you where it was defined, but if you remove the optimizations, then it might. So um, we, can, we can do that, and we can go back to where the train operation uh, was defined, train model, TNO function, and then I'll just say optimizer equals uh, none. Oh, sorry, I have to do uh, mode equals TNO dot mode optimizer none. Is that correct? Yes. So it's recompiling the function. Let's recompile everything. And then the updated error message says backtrace when the node was created and it's somewhere in my kernel and it's on the line p y given x equals that. So of course we have like lots of things in there, but you know that there's a dot product and it's probably a mismatch between those. So that's, that's one example. Uh, then there are other techniques that we can use. We can have the breakpoints, as I said, and so on. Um, I don't have right now a tutorial about that, but uh, have some online and I could point you to that. One last question. Hi. Um, I have some models I'd like to distribute, and I don't want to require people to install Python and a bunch of compilers and stuff, so does Theano have any support for compiling models into a binary? Okay, so unfortunately, uh, at the time, we're pretty intermingled with Python a lot because uh, all the memory management during the execution is done by Python. And we use uh, NumPy uh, and DRAs for our intermediate values on the CPU and the similar structure on the GPU, even though that one might be easier to convert. But yeah, all our C code uh, deals with Python and does the incref and decref and so on so that uh, Python manages the memory. So if you want to distribute that, uh, I would suggest like a Docker container something like that so recently, uh, even for GPU, NVIDIA Docker is quite efficient. And we don't have any more slowdowns that, uh, that we had seen earlier. So it, it's not ideal. And uh, if like someone has some time and the will to, to help us disentangle uh, the NO from the Python runtime, it would be awesome, but that's a huge project. Okay, let's uh, thank Pascal again. Um, we reconvene in uh, 55 minutes for the next talk. Have a good lunch. <laughs>